Sandra said that she had to um, twist my arm for me to do a talk. <laughs> it's really quite an understatement. <laughs> but here I am, and I'm going to talk to you today about convict women at the New Norfolk Asylum. Nearly 400 women were admitted to the New Norfolk Asylum, either as convicts or ex-convicts. Of these, nearly 50% were born in Ireland. In historical research, it is difficult to avoid language used at the time, but which would be considered today as inappropriate or ignorant. The terms insane and lunatic for the mentally ill, for example, and idiot and imbecile for those with an intellectual disability. At the time of its closure in 2000, the institution was the oldest psychiatric hospital in Australia, still standing on its original site. The institution changed its name several times over its 171-year history. It was known as the Lunatic Asylum New Norfolk, 1829 to 1859, the Hospital for the Insane, New Norfolk, 1859 to 1915, the Mental Diseases Hospital, New Norfolk, 1915 to 1937, Lachlan Park Hospital, 1937 to 1968, and finally, the Royal Derwent Hospital, 1968 to 2000. Variations in the name of the institution reflect changes in community and government attitudes towards mental illness. It was not until the 1960s, however, that change, changing attitudes and improved understanding led to the separation of facilities for the intellectually disabled from those for the treatment of mental illness. Responsibility for the former was transferred to the Department of Community Services in 1919 as the Willow Court Program, named after the willows believed to have been planted by Lady Franklin from shoots on the grave of Napoleon Bonaparte at St Helena in the Atlantic Ocean. <clears throat> Before 1824, those labelled lunatics were sent from Van Diemen's Land to the asylum in Sydney. When New South Wales and Van Diemen's Land separated in 1824, people diagnosed with mental illness were housed in the Colonial Hospital in Hobart or in Launceston Jail. The New Norfolk Asylum began life in the late 1820s as the Invalid Depot, a small hospital established by Lieutenant Governor Arthur. He ordered the transfer to New Norfolk of all invalid convicts from Hobart Town, Launceston and all outstations. As Susan Piddock explains in a space of their own, its purpose was twofold. Firstly, to serve the local community. Many of those admitted were convicts who worked on local road gangs or fell ill while assigned. And secondly, to house the mentally ill suffering from acute illness. The first invalids, all male, were admitted in June 1827. A lunatics ward was added two years later behind the invalid building. And the first admissions were recorded in April 1829. Not only were invalids and lunatics separately housed, but separation was also gender-based. In 1841, the first lunacy legislation in Van Diemen's Land was passed. Lunacy was simply defined as insane persons, and for the first time, admission was regulated, the establishment of asylums was formalised and a board of commissioners was set up to oversee them. The New Norfolk Asylum continued as a dual purpose institution at least until 1845, when it was described as an establishment for the reception of pauper invalids and lunatics. <clears throat> In October 1855, as was the case with many institutions in the colony, the asylum transferred from the control of the imperial or British government to the colonial or Tasmanian government. In 1858, the government passed legislation which extended the definition of lunatic to any person being a lunatic or an idiot or of unsound mind. The statute tightened the provisions of existing legislation by regulating committals through the courts. 
which now needed the approval of one or two medical officers. This act, incidentally, the 1858 Act, was not repealed until 1963. In 1882, a Royal Commission was appointed to consider the state of lunatic asylums in Tasmania. Its recommendations were ignored, possibly because it criticised the government for its neglect and poor funding. The government's response was to legislate in 1885 to abolish the commissioners. <clears throat> Today, the site is listed as a place of heritage significance on the Tasmanian Heritage Register as the Willow Court Asylum Complex. It is significant historically for being the first purpose-built institution for mental health in the Australian colonies. Willow Court and the hospital precinct remain highly significant today as the history and landscapes of the site record the evolution of philosophies for treating the mentally ill and intellectually disabled across the 19th and 20th centuries. Anyone knows where this sign is? It's gone missing and the people at New Norfolk want it back. My presentation will focus on the institution in the convict and colonial era and the lives of convict and ex-convict women. There was very little understanding in the 19th century of mental illness reflected in the fact that mental illness and intellectual disability were considered as one. Those responsible for the care of the patients had only a minimal understanding of their needs and conditions, being considered hopeless, helpless and in need of protection. They were fated by definition to spend their entire lives within the asylum. Medical officers commonly brought with them their own prejudices towards convicts and the poor, and specialist training for the staff did not begin until 1919. Convict records, admission registers and case notes provide information about the perceived causes of the conditions for which the women were admitted, the supposed cause of insanity. One of the themes that stands out is that the cause was often unknown, Perhaps this arose as much from the idios idiosyncratic and complex personal histories of the patients as from a lack of medical understanding. In many respects, the terminology of the 19th century does not adequately explain the medical conditions that led to the admission of individuals to the asylum. Generally speaking, the purpose of the new Norfolk institution in the 19th century was to remove from society the mentally ill including those by definition self suffering from alcoholism and those with an intellectual disability. There will be a test. This shows um, its admission register and it shows the date of admission, name, sex, marital status, um, status, for example, convict pauper and previous occupation, by whose authorities form of mental disorder, supposed cause of insanity, bodily condition, if epileptic or congenital idiot, duration of existing attacks, state of removal, discharge or death. And you can see the reference. It's an archival reference, HSD 247-11. The first female admission to what was called the lunatic ward was on the 14th of January, 1830. Irish woman Judith Chambers was admitted suffering from mania, a mental illness marked by periods of great excitement or euphoria, delusions and overactivity. Judith had been tried in Wexford, Ireland in 1815 and was sentenced to transportation for seven years for stealing. She had numerous colonial offences for being drunk and disorderly, idle and disorderly, and in 1825, she was described as a rogue and a vagabond. She was in and out of jail in the Hobart Town female factory. Her mania may have been related to her drinking, but it's difficult to be sure because of the lack of detail in the records. Judith spent just over 30 years in the asylum, dying there in 1860 from influenza. She was 79. One of the first convict women 
woman admitted to the asylum with dementia or intellectual disability was Mary Pashley, who arrived on the America in 1831. She'd been tried in Lancaster and was transported for life for stealing from the person. Mary had repeated colonial convictions for drunkenness and insolence and was admitted to the asylum in 1837. She died there, she died there 22 years later, aged 53. Other, often, admission was simply because the women were disruptive. Honey Dower has suggested that admissions were not necessarily about being mad, but were an institutional tool to identify troublesome women. Noisy women were considered an aberration and unmanageable. Noise was an indication of their poor mental condition. Tidiness and tranquility were desirable, but case notes frequently refer to the women as filthy and untidy. Eleanor Sullivan was described as a dirty drudge, an untidy imbecile. Maria Matthews was a miserable looking creature in a much filthy condition covered with vermin and filth. Women suffering hallucinations were disruptive. Nappy King thought Queen Anne was her grandmother. Martha Merrifield suffered from religious delusion. Incoherence, laughing without cause and muttering were assumed to be indicative of mental illness. Most of the women admitted to the asylum already had a medical diagnosis, such as mania, amentia, dementia, monomania, epilepsy and various con congenital disorders. Alcoholism or intemperance was seen as a common cause. Some admissions related to childbirth, directly or indirectly. As Charlie Fox writes in his article, Exploring Amentia, classification of conditions was a developing science. Bishop Wilson in 1859 advocated classification, stating there was, and I quote, no opportunity of classifying properly these unfortunate beings. The congenital idiot living in the daytime with the recently admitted patient, the noisy and offensive in language with the silent, the delicate minded and the tranquil, the drivelling imbecile with the scrupulously neat in habit and feeling, end of quote. As late as 1883, the women in the asylum remained unclassified except for the separation of violent women in the refractory building. Some women, including Mary Griffin, Emma Stamp and Catherine Walsh, had pre-existing conditions when they were transported or had been previously institutionalised in an asylum. And I think it's a wonder they were allowed to embark. For some of the women, poor mental health became apparent during the voyage to Van Diemen's Land. It's difficult to say whether this was the result of a pre-existing condition or the trauma and distress produced by exile and subsequent voyage. Nicola Gock argues that for convict women, the trauma of forced migration was exacerbated by the stresses of incarceration, discipline, punishment and forced labour. Many women were traumatised by the transportation experience, caught up in a regiment system of containment and permanent displacement to a place on the other side of the world. She adds, it is not surprising that so many women behaved badly aboard ship and upon arrival in Hobart Town, when the realisation of what the future held started to become a reality with brutal realisation that they would never see their families again, it is no wonder they continue to behave in a disorderly manner, to seek solace in alcohol and to rail against the system in ways which saw them diagnosed with mania. Was there a link between manifestations of insanity and the treatment of convict women? Did spending a week in the coffin-like solitary box with cold water being poured over her head contribute to the onset of Catherine Toomey's mania? Sometimes there was a suggestion that illness was feigned. Scottish woman Agnes Chambers, 
who arrived in 1852 at the age of 26, was transported seven years for robbery. She had three previous convictions for assault, six for theft and eight for disorderly behaviour. The surgeon superintendent on the Emma Eugenia believed Agnes was feigning illness to avoid being transported. However, Agnes was admitted to the New Norfolk Asylum in 1852, less than a year after arriving in the colony, so perhaps it wasn't a ruse. She was admitted to the General Hospital from the ship and then from the hospital to the asylum. She died there in 1855, aged 30. During the voyage of the Tasmania in 1844, Surgeon Superintendent Thomas Seaton reported that three women were very troublesome and the cause of many a disturbance on board. According to Seaton, Ellen Adams was the most troublesome and dangerous of the three. She was shrewd and malicious with strong natural abilities, but her imagination was affected owing to which she used to fabricate the most unaccountable tales, yet narrate them with such an air of plausibility and seeming to truth and earnestness as would impose upon anyone not aware of her state. Ellen Adams had been tried in Cheshire in 1844 for stealing a cloak and was sentenced to transportation for seven years. Ellen left behind her husband, Robert Newton, and her child. She arrived in Van Diemen's Land at the age of 45. On her conduct, conduct, conduct record, the surgeon's report described Ellen as very troublesome from a deranged intellect. All three of her major convict records noted that she was of insane mind or unsound mind. Within weeks of arriving in the colony, Eleanor, Ellen was admitted to the New Norfolk Asylum suffering from monomania, an exaggerated or obsessive preoccupation with one thing. The cause of her illness was not known. Ellen spent the next 27 years in the New Norfolk Asylum. When she was admitted, her mental condition was described as mental alienation characterised by restlessness. She imagined that she was free and that she had been sent to the country by friends. She was said to talk much but with little purpose. She complained about her detention, saying that she had been forcibly detained. Seven months after her admission, Ellen was described as very easily excited, talking loudly and boldly, and still complaining of the treatment she received. In, November, in the November of Ellen's first year in the asylum, the matron reported that she was very troublesome and violent and had struck the ward's woman on the head with a pannikin. She was confined to in a cell until she quietened down. But after she was released, she became very violent and abusive and was again confined in a cell. In December 1845, her notes stated, a trifle will excite her. She becomes very noisy and violent. The pattern of violence continued for some time. Ellen was increasingly described as incoherent, irritable and maniacal. In March 1855, she was settled enough to be employed knitting if not spoken to or intimidated, she remained quiet, but was full of rambling delusions. Her bodily health remained good throughout, but she suffered in winter from cold and influenza with considerable bronchial irritation. Year after year, page after page, her condition was recorded as unaltered, apart from occasional remarks, dupes fantastically as ever. She was not receiving treatment. Finally, in late 1871, Ellen was diagnosed with a tumour on her left breast. It was malignant, ulcerated and hemorrhaging and she was in constant pain. She died of cancer of the breast in 1872. She was 70. Most of the women were admitted to the New Norfolk Asylum from the General Hospital in Hobart with a certificate stating they were of unsound mind. And I know you can't really see that, but the bottom part reads, when admitted into hospital, Eliza Smith's clothes were in the 
almost filthy state, and she did not seem to be aware of the fact. She gave a most rambling, incoherent account of herself. Her principal hallucination seems to be that some person whom she styles a man comes nightly to torment her and the other females of the hospital. She is continually on the watch, wandering about frequently in a state of nudity. She gets excited and laughs most immoderately when describing these nightly rambles. Physically, she is robust and healthy, taking a double ration and says she gets nothing to eat. A particularly sad case occurred in 1866. Mary Ann O'Brien had married convict Thomas Chalk in 1848. After her marriage, she was known as Frances Chalk. While Thomas, described as a respectable sawyer, was away working on the Surreal Causeway, Frances, who was pregnant with her fifth child, fell into the company of drinkers and was hocused or drugged. On Sunday last, she was observed in the public streets all but naked and presented the appearance of a dangerous lunatic. A constable took her in his charge and she's been confined in the hospital till yesterday. The magistrates had no alternative but to order her removal to the New Norfolk Asylum for the Insane. As she is a most docile woman, a good mother, particularly fond of her children, and altogether unexceptionable in character, there is every probability under the able treatment, Dr Houston, that she will speedily be restored to her right reason. Unfortunately, that was not the case. A poor, unfortunate woman named Frances Chalk was forwarded on Friday from the General Hospital Hobart Town to the New Norfolk Asylum in charge of two constables in a cab. That, in accordance with the instructions received, the woman sat between the constables. <clears throat> That each holding a hand, that twice during the journey they gave her a small portion of wine and water, that they never moved from their appointed places until they reached their destination, and that when they were giving up their charge, they then for the first time were made aware that the poor woman had been delivered of what afterwards from Dr Houston's post-mortem examination proved to be a stillborn infant. On one or two occasions, the constables felt a stronger twitching of her hands than usual, but as they had been informed she had a propensity to bite, they merely imagined that was what she was trying to do. As Dr Houston's evidence was conclusive as to the child never having lived, the jury returned a verdict in accordance with the facts. Some of the jury, jury was strongly of opinion that a female attendant ought to have been sent with the poor woman. The patient is said to be doing well, except she wasn't. She died a few days later. Her cause of death was recorded as disease of the brain, no mention of giving birth under such traumatic circumstances. From the time a patient arrived at the asylum, detailed ca case notes were recorded. Mary Brennan, for example, was admitted to the New Norfolk Asylum on the approval of the Governor in March 1858, after appearing before the board of the General Hospital in Hobart, where she had been under observation for two months. Her admission papers noted that, from the first, she exhibited symptoms of insanity, but was harmless. Recently, she had become dangerous and violent to herself and others. The board was of the opinion that she is of unsound mind and recommended that she be sent to the lunatic asylum. Mary was admitted with mania and epilepsy. On admission, she was described as a woman of dark hair and eyes of excitable temperament. She stated that she was married with a child who was taken from her shortly before she was admitted and her breast was still secreting milk. Her son was born in the Brickfields Hiring Depot and was four months old when Mary went into the asylum. Mary had severe 
severe and frequent epileptic attacks, and she was often excitable. Like so many of the women, her case notes were repetitive. In September 1867, however, Mary seriously injured a nurse. She was often placed in seclusion for bad, bad behaviour. Mary, a widow aged 30, had arrived on the Martin Luther from Ireland in 1852, transported for stealing two coats. She had several colonial offences, including being absent, refusing to work and drunkenness. She died in 1889 from epilepsy and heart disease after 31 years in the asylum. <laughs> Margaret Thomas arrived on the Royal Admiral in 1842, having been tried for stealing. Her colonial offences were typical of many convict women, being drunk, absent without leave, out after hours, idle and disorderly, and of course many drink-related offences, including being drunk and using, using indecent language and being drunk and disturbing the peace. In 1844, two years after arriving in the colony, Margaret married fellow convict Richard Copperwhite, or Copperwhite, who arrived in 1824, sent, sentenced to transportation for life. Richard was a frequent offender and spent time at Macquarie Harbour and Port Arthur. In 1853, Richard, aged 49, was involved in a fight in Liverpool Street, Hobart. He subsequently died from the head wound he received. Earlier that day, Richard had collected Margaret from the Cascades Female Factory, where she had just finished a three-month sentence. They stopped for a drink at the Cascade Inn where Richard had been drinking while waiting for Margaret's release. Then visited a second public house further down Macquarie Street, ending up at the Man of Ross in Liverpool Street. By then, Richard was very drunk, no doubt a factor in the incident which caused his death. Shortly after Richard's death, the Colonial Times reported under the heading, A Nice Woman, Mrs Copperwhite, the wife of a man who was killed in Liverpool Street, employed Monday last collecting subscriptions to bury her husband. Before the day was out, however, she became very drunk on the contributions of her sympathising friends and was conveyed to the watch house when after a night's incarceration, she was brought before the police magistrate. A month later, Margaret was charged with being idle and disorderly and was sentenced to nine months' imprisonment with hard labour. She was first admitted to the New Norfolk Asylum in 1859. In the 1860s, she spent time in the Cascades Invalid Depot and was readmitted to the asylum in June 1871, suffering from dementia. Aged 55, she died at the asylum in 1886 from concussion of the brain after falling down some stairs. Female insanity was believed to be connected to a woman's reproductive system, included in the case notes, particularly in the notes which accompany the patient to the asylum, are comments on menstruation. This was the case for Anne Peacock, who first menstruated at 14 but stopped during the voyage. Anne, aged 21, was convicted of setting fire to the union workhouse in Huntingdonshire. She was sentenced to death because there were people in the building, but this was commuted to transportation for 10 years. During the voyage, she was said to be a quiet, harmless creature. She had 13 previous convictions, mostly for being disorderly and a vagrant, and continued to offend in Van Diemen's land. She was admitted to the asylum in 1848. Her admission record stated that she had been in the colony 13 months and had, strong, had shown strong evidence of mental excitement since arriving. She broke windows in the general hospital and was restrained. She had a violent temper and no control over her actions, although at times she was rational. While in the asylum, Anne was employed as a servant for a short time in the quarters of, Miss, of Mr Houston, the house surgeon. 
She was said to be very industrious. Within a month, though, she had been removed from the position described as an ignorant and bad-tempered girl. She complained of headaches and was not sleeping. By November, she was employed at needlework and assisting the nurse in her ward. She had grown very stout but was free from headaches. She began to complain that it was unreasonable to be kept in the asylum. In 1849, she was recommended for discharge and was sent to the Brickfields. However, in August, Anne was declared insane again and was readmitted to the asylum. Her notes on admission to the asylum stated her phrenological development is inferior and the board finds that in addition to a constant state of imbecility, she is subject to uncontrollable bursts of moral insanity. In September 1849, a month later, the nurse reported that Anne was pregnant and in January she gave birth to a son. Anne was released from the asylum to the Cascades Female Factory in October 1850. Her son, her child, William Peacock, died of marasmus, which is a wasting disease, at the female factory aged 14 months. Interestingly, Anne's convict records state that she was 21 when she arrived. Asylum records show that she was 17 when she was first admitted and 18 when she was admitted for the second time two years later. Anne married Thomas Ogden in 1854 and they had at least three children. The family struggled. Thomas was frequently drunk and forced his sons to beg, beating them if they did not bring home enough. The family seemed to have survived by selling Anne's crochet work. Thomas was admitted to the asylum in 1872 and died there in 1876. Anne's children, Mary Jane, Robert and William, were admitted to the orphan school in 1864. At that time, Anne was in prison. In 1868, Robert and William were sent to a reformatory known as the Boys Training School, the forerunner of the, of the Ashley Detention Centre. Robert was executed for murder in 1883. A newspaper report at this time said that Anne was well known in the rural districts as Gypsy. She died at the Newtown Charitable Institution in 1907, aged 82, and was buried as a pauper in Cornelian Bay Cemetery. Mary Nolan committed arson to join her daughter, Margaret Butler, another arsonist. Mary was 60 when she he arrived on the Duke of Cornwall in 1850, sentenced to transportation for 15 years. Instead of being reunited with her daughter, Mary was admitted to the asylum with a mentor in 1858 and spent 14 years there. She was 75 when she died in 1872. Some convict women had multiple admissions. Martha Mary Field was admitted to the New Norfolk Asylum three times, each with a different diagnosis. Linking convict background to asylum patients was highlighted in 1859 by the commissioners of the Hospital for the Insane at New Norfolk who wrote, it must be borne in mind that a large majority of the patients confined in the asylum have been of the convict class, the offspring of diseased parents, inheriting in very many cases a defective intellect brought up from the earliest childhood childhood in misery and vice, and leading in after years a life of central debauchery and crime, resulting in enfeeblement alike of body and mind. A more hopeless class of subjects it would be impossible to collect together in one institution. As with diagnosis, treatment was problematic. In the 19th century, no effective treatment was available. In 1847, the superintendent of the asylum, Dr John Meyer, stated, as regards the insane, no attempt is made to cure. Patients were merely imprisoned there and many from mental derangement become confirmed maniacs in consequence of the imprisonment and harsh treatment. Treatment was prescribed after analysing bowel habits, menstrual cycle, general health, 
and appearance as well as the behaviour of the women. Diet, occasional opiates, cupping, especially for those suffering from headaches, and amazingly, extra alcohol were among the most frequent of the limited treatments available. Strychnine was also used. A rush of cold water was used frequently to calm people and mercury was administered for the disturbed. As early as the 1850s, it was recorded that patients were given an application of electricity. Physical restraint was both treatment and punishment. Women who ex exhibited violent behaviour were restrained by methods including straitjackets and handcuffs, a practice that prevailed until 1860. When Catherine Toomey lapsed into a state of maniacal excitement characterised by destructive habits and filthy and indecent language, she was restrained and moved to the refractory division. When she became tranquil, she was returned to the front division. Labour was an integral part of the convict system. At the asylum work, including sewing, laundry and scrubbing floors was a prescribed treatment. Those convict women who could not undertake basic tasks were deemed unfit for labour. When she arrived on the Blackfriar in 1851, Catherine Walsh was diagnosed with incurable hereditary insanity and was judged to be unfit for service. Catherine appears to have slipped through the bureaucratic cracks. No admission or case notes have been located for her, but according to her convict conduct record, she was still in the asylum in 1862. Throughout its history, the asylum had problems with overcrowding, staffing and living conditions. Additional buildings were added as accommodation pressures increased. Overcrowding reduced the ability for classification deemed necessary to individual recovery. Female convicts at the asylum lived behind high walls in small and squalid rooms reminiscent of prison architecture. The high walls, however, did not prevent some of the women from escaping. Mary Griffin escaped four times, once over the wall and once for nearly three weeks. Generally, however, life for the women was extremely confined and often basic. The day for the women was spent on the ward or in the day room. The only other living space was the exercise yard with its high walls. Maintaining patient and ward cleanliness was difficult due to the almost complete lack of sanitary provisions. The removal of convict mothers to the asylum resulted in the fragmentation of families. Visits by family members were not encouraged or practical. As Stephanie McComb notes, when Anne Gillingham's husband visited her, she suffered a relapse. The visit had a disastrous effect on Anne, who never recovered, sinking into a state of imbecility. Most of the women lost contact with their families. For eight years, Nappy King and her blind Irish-born son, Izod, lived within a few hundred metres of each other, but was separated by the asylum's high internal brick walls, and there is no evidence of contact between the two. Most of the women, once they were admitted to the asylum, did not leave. Elizabeth McHugh was incarcerated for nearly 50 years. Bridget O'Brien spent 60 years in the asylum. Most of the early burials took place at Stephen Street Cemetery. Some were in the North Circle burial ground and there were several Catholic burials on the New Norfolk Glebe. <laughs> Few families recovered the bodies of those admitted to the asylum, perhaps shamed by social stigma. Some of the convict women admitted to the New Norfolk Asylum lived into the 20th century. Mary Ann Braley died in 1902, Anne Peacock in 1907, and Bridget O'Brien in 1924. <coughs> Many of those admitted to the asylum were forgotten even by their own families, largely due to social stigma. Relatives regularly 
concealed the details of what they considered shameful and many disorders which today are either accepted or curable were hidden away and not spoken of. Families were fragmented and lost contact as a result. The narratives of the convict women admitted to the New Norfolk Asylum continue to highlight that there is much more to a convict life than a crime, trial and sentence. In colonial Van Diemen's land, civil registration, convict records, newspaper reports and asylum records, especially admission registers and case notes, help reconstruct the lives of those convict women admitted to the New Norfolk Asylum. And in in doing so, provide an understanding of the treatment of mental illness in the 19th century and its complexities relating to gender, incarceration and treatment. There is an extraordinary and at times disturbing nexus between the treatment of conflicts, approaches to female gender and construction of mental illness. This interconnection provides the opportunity for contemporary reflection on discourses on all three aspects that prevail in current society. We have come a long way, but we still have a long way to go. Thank you. And if I could just mention, <clears throat> there are Marks over on the side for Convict Women's Press, and this is the most recent Convict Women's Press book, Convict Lives, Female Convicts at the New Norfolk Asylum. And some of the stories that I've mentioned today um, have been published in there, not all of them, but some of them. So have a look at the website and see if you can get a book online. Thank you, Di. Thank you. I'm glad I twisted your arm <laughs> and hopefully I could twist it again next year. <laughs> thank you very much. And um, thank you all for coming. And we've got another talk on tomorrow with Kate um, and it's the superintendent of New Norfolk Asylum and the Kenny Affair. But that will be in Allport. So if you're coming tomorrow, just, just be aware that it's where you, Everyone knows where the Allport Library is at the moment. And we've got a really good um, uh, exhibition there at the moment too, so please go. And we've got an exhibition that's nearly completed today with all the house, um, how to do your house and plans and everything. So have, if you walked up the stairs, you'll be able to see it on the wall. And if you go into the microspace, it's all on the wall as well. My favourite is the um, the Mount Wellington, the um, the restaurant that got uh, burnt oh, down. Yeah. There's a photo of it. It looks lovely. Sandra, I'm happy to yeah. answer questions you, if you've finished yes. saying. Yeah. Would you like to, anybody with questions? Oh, Lydia. Yeah, here it is. I don't know, but were there any suffragettes in there? Were there? Not to my knowledge, and they certainly wouldn't have been in the same part as the convict women. Um, there was a ladies' cottage, and if they were there, I, I don't think so. But yeah, there were certainly orphan school children who were sent from the orphan school to the asylum. One little boy was sent there at the age of four, and he lived there all of his life. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, and the person died of what's just called mania. Is mania a fatal illness? Or no, no, it's a mental illness. Lost the there would have been a, another cause of death, but they didn't. Re when was it? Yeah, it's not a cause of death, so it should have been something. Else. Most of the ones that I've seen, you know, they die of influenza or um, cancer or heart disease, and they may have had mania, they may have had dementia. So how, how, would you, how would you find records for the site? Have you got the death certificate? No, I don't. 
That would be the first thing I would do is to get her death certificate. To get his death certificate. Oops. Um, amentia usually means an absence. So it's um, it's the term that they use for people with intellectual disability. Yeah. And dementia is dementia as we know it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you all very much. Thank you.